the role of Europe. Okay, well, very good. Um, good <clears throat> evening, everyone. My name is Anthony Oscar, Kilo 8 Zulu Tango. I am the Section Youth Coordinator for Ohio. We have a panel of three other Section Youth Coordinators this evening. Uh, so we'll be having a panel discussion. And the idea is for you to ask us questions. And uh, we have a few things to, to start uh, off with. There's a survey that we put into the uh, chat. And Dan will put it in there again, or someone will put it in there again. Um, if you could fill out the survey, that would be very helpful. And I have a few slides with some links in it. Uh, the slides are available and I also put that in the chat and I'll put it in there again at, R, at tiny.cc slash rpsyc. And you might say, well, why would I need that? Well, there's some links in here that you might find useful. And there's my email contact information. The panelists tonight, uh, I'll let them introduce themselves a little bit later, but these are our panelists for this evening. And the survey link. So, I just thought about this since last week. We got together on on Monday evening, and I was thinking about, you know, what are six to ten things that I really would want to emphasize over and over again when I'm talking about youth. So I just put these all together in one slide. But the whole idea, when I'm thinking about my interaction with youth as a section youth coordinator, it's a, a positive exposure to amateur radio, integration with existing programs. Uh, being flexible, nimble, and professional, um, getting all the ages, 5 to, two, to 25, I'm going to consider youth, uh, something to take home, fun activities, and if you license, you must mentor, and always use safety. So let's just look at these real quick, and I'll try not to be too long with this, but number one goal is always exposure in my case. Whenever I'm working with a group of youth, that's my number one goal. Things that happen after that, depend on the kids that I'm exposing and what their reaction to the exposure is. I know that when I was that age, all I needed was someone to tell me what amateur radio was and how to do it. And I would have jumped in with both feet, but I didn't know someone. So I always like to use exposure as the first key. And then the people that are interested sort of flow to the top. One of the things to do when you're doing exposure, though, is to avoid the jargon, the ham speak, the techno babble, et cetera. It's a good way to turn people off and scare them away. Integrating with existing programs. Schools integrate with lessons uh, with an amateur radio slant that fits into the current curriculum so that you're doing things that they're already doing but with an amateur radio flair to them. Scouting has some natural pathways in, uh, integrating with merit badges and advancement paths. And outdoor activities are always a great thing to integrate with. With communities, libraries, uh, clubs, et cetera, think about activities that match up with what the event is. So if they're having a, you know, a community event, uh, try and figure out an amateur radio activity that would match up with it. Flexible, nimble, and professional. The question I always bring when I'm asking someone if I can work with their group is not, this is what we do. I want to instead ask the question, what can we do to help you in your mission to serve youth? So the focus goes back to what they're doing and how we can help them. I always have a wide variety of program choices when I'm working with a school and working with teachers. I give them options so they can pick out the one that they would most like to do with their group. The main thing that you really need to do is be flexible and be able to adjust to your audience reactions. If you're, if whatever you're doing is is not hitting, is not going over with the group very well, you might need to shift gears. So it's very important to be able to do that when you're working with uh, a group that you've never worked with before. Also, there's always unforeseen events and activities going on, and it's very important to pre to present a professional appearance and dress actions and preparation. I've had many teachers uh, exclaim after we're done. Oh, I thought this was just going to be a show and tell, and I didn't realize you were going to tie it into the curriculum and, and that you were going to have actual things for the students to do. So being uh, professional is very important. I always say don't dress for a ham fest when you're going to do a, profession, a, a, a demonstration at a school. Leave the goofy hat, the pins, and everything, it, <laughs> and save them for the ham fest. Um, even though we have a wide range of youth that we can address, the, the way you address each of the groups is different. So I have a tiered approach depending on what age group I'm working with. Um, I always like to have something for them to take home. It's very hard for them to focus for a long period of time. I'm usually doing a whole day session. And even if they do focus, most of the stuff they 
is new to them. So they forget a lot of it before they get home. So I like to have something that they can take home with them, whether it's written materials, uh, the comic book series, I quite, quite often use the, the ICOM comic book series, uh, whether it's a craft, we make uh, clothes pin keys sometimes or a trinket or um, online resources that they can have. And I'll talk a little bit about how you can have handouts <clears throat> that work are much more effective than paper handouts where people at a public event can scan the information into their phone so that it actually gets home instead of laying on the floor of their car and get eat by the dog. Um, and I always provide items to the teachers ahead of time and afterward both. So that there's follow-up items available. I like to hopefully make the activities fun, but remember what is fun for you may not be fun for the students. I don't understand why anyone wouldn't find amateur radio just like one of the most fun things in the world. But that's not the case with everyone. So you need to be able to have uh, some planning. Things that they can do themselves. I found that on, online software defined radios are a really big portion of my in-school presentations now because the kids are do, tuning them themselves. <clears throat> and things that they do for fun. So I like to include act outdoor activities, things in the form of a game, uh, video screens, competition, making things are all fun things. If you license, you must mentor. I think quite often when we think about youth involvement, we focus way too much on licensing and not enough on exposure and mentoring. Uh, the licensing is, is a rather artificial step in the whole process. And taking a group of 30 uh, students in a class and forcing them to go through a licensing process and pass the exam. Yeah, they'll get their call signs, but they're sort of what I call zombie licensees. Uh, they don't make contacts uh, except for when you're there. Uh, they drop out quickly. They're not going to be lifetime ham. So you can waste a lot of energy uh, getting a whole group of students licensed that are not going to go beyond that. So if you are going to, I suggest you focus more on a smaller group of more interested students and you provide strong mentoring opportunities, chances for them to get on the air. Think about involving them in your local club's activities. There's no reason they couldn't, you couldn't have them do field day, fox hunts, other activities with your local club, public service events. And finally, the last thing, I, the, the last point is always follow youth safety guidelines. There's a great set available from a number of organizations out there, including the Boy Scouts has a free course that you can take. But remember this, and also remember, when you're working with your local club, not everyone in your local club is a prime candidate to work with youth. So sometimes you just have to ask people not to be involved. Always get parent and teacher buy-in in the process. I have a whole presentation. It's 115 slides or some ridiculous amount, and it's available at this link, tiny.cc slash Y-I-A-R. By the way, this is my grandson, Aaron. He started uh, sixth grade today. Wow. Holden, I'm sorry, my son is Aaron. My wife just yelled from the other room, that's Holden, that's my grandson. <laughs> and he started fifth grade, not sixth grade. I just got all corrected on everything. Um, this is the handout that I use quite often. And this is great. You can even laminate these and not have individual paper copies. Each one has a, sp a QR code so that if you're doing this at a public service event um, like a, or a county fair or something like that, instead of having a bunch of paper that just gets lost, have them actually shoot the QR codes with their, their phone and that way they actually go home with them. And the nice thing is some of these they can actually use on their phone, such as the online software defined radios, which is what uh, Holden was uh, doing in the one other picture that I have. I don't have that picture here. Um, I also have a thing on my website with information. So this tie.cc slash HYR gives you this two-sided handout that you can print out. Uh, Martha was uh, nice enough to add a number of links that I have in here, and I'll just uh, show you that there's three slides with Martha's links, and uh, she has some good photos here that are very good uh, activity photos, including Samara's contacts and two videos. So those are available. So this link for this little short presentation is available at tiny.cc slash rpsyc. And now we'll go ahead and we'll let our panelists to introduce themselves and we'll start with Martha. Uh, we went by, we we'll put them in order by state here. So Martha is in Georgia. I'll let you go ahead, Martha, and I'll stop my screen share. Alrighty. Um, as you can see, my name is Martha Muir, uh, W4MSA. Uh, I was a teacher for many years. I retired just before the pandemic hit. 
Um, and I uh, was a physical science teacher the final years of my career and incorporated ham radio a little bit into my physical science, but I also was very fortunate to have a class called ACE, which was a STEM enrichment class, and we did ham radio as part of our STEM enrichment. And um, my take on ham radio is not necessarily to make my students ham radio operators, but to entice them into the fun things that ham radio offers them to hopefully lead them into a college study, course of study in a STEM area, and hopefully a career in a STEM field. That's my ultimate goal. As a section youth coordinator, when uh, my uh, section manager asked me to do this, he said he wants me to reach out to teachers and try to help them bring ham radio things into the classroom and reach out to students, see what their interest is in ham radio and and hopefully get them involved. And that's what I do. Uh, my take is, is quite different from Anthony's. Um, what I seem to enjoy to do is, you know, find a group that is interested in doing some ham radio type things and then find a local club that is willing to work with that group to develop their interests. Uh, one of the, the areas that I do, I'm involved in the ARIS program, Amateur Radio on the International Space Station. Uh, my school was fortunate to be able to have an ARIS contact in 2013, and then very, very, very incredibly fortunate we got another one in 2018. They are magic. They're, you know, lifetime memorable activities for everybody involved. Uh, when I go to teacher workshops or other uh, opportunities, my opening line is, to a teacher or to a principal or to a superintendent, how would you like an opportunity for your students to talk to an astronaut on the ISS as it flies over your school? What kind of fool is gonna say, no thanks, no. To me, that's the way to get your foot in the door to try to bring some ham radio into a school because otherwise the schools are very busy. But if you tempt them with an heiress contact, that's the way because you need to have a basically a year of activities leading up to that uh, contact and hopefully some activities afterwards. Um, I'm on the ARIS USA Educational Committee. I'm an ARIS Educational Ambassador, which means I'm assigned to a school or an entity that is granted an ARIS contact and work with them to develop um, their educational plan. And I'm also the secretary of the ARIS International Group. So I'm involved in ARIS. Um, the links that I that uh, Anthony has put together. Those are uh, some photos of some of the events that uh, I've been involved with. Uh, we did, did things um, for the Atlanta Maker Fair, the Atlanta Science Festivals, and again, helping other groups with their heiress contacts. And I, I am definitely the beneficiary of the North Fulton Amateur Radio League. They came in, they work with their, my students a whole lot, established great friendships. And after a while, they started inviting my students to go with them to other schools to do ham radio things. And that was such an empowering thing for my students. And if you want, I can tell you why. Um, so I don't do the youth coordination thing that Anthony does, but I do my own. And I think that's okay. We don't have to do it the same. And Martha, I think that's one thing I, that I don't think a lot of the people realize is the section youth coordinator spends a lot of time working with other educators, not just with youth. Yep. And I think that's quite often a misunderstood aspect. I'll, a lot of times I'll get people saying, well, I have some youth I want you to work with. And really what I want to say, what I need to say to them is how can I help you work with them? because I can't be everywhere in the state and I can't exactly. work with all the youth. So that's a misconception that a lot of people have about the section youth coordinators. But another thing that Martha brought up is very true is we all have different styles and we, we work, we focus uh, in on different main uh, focuses within our things. Um, our next speaker is going to be Barry. I'm sorry, Eric. I'm sorry, Eric uh, from Maryland. So Eric, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and I'll go ahead and un, uh, share my screen here. Yes, thanks, Anthony. Um, I don't have any slides. I just want to kind of go through some of the things that I've done. Um, Anthony has a tremendous program 
I remember seeing some of his presentations up at Dayton or at uh, Xenia, and it was definitely great to see it there. So um, I'm kind of hopefully learning from him and kind of build on some of the things that he's done. Uh, but that though is I'm the section youth coordinator. I'm, uh, I, re I used to work for FEMA and I worked for the chief technology officer. So understanding how emergency communications and all that kind of works together um, and how the information is being passed has really been a big change that's going on right now, especially with some of the things they call like, I call it direct sensing, where we're getting more, a lot of people call it the 5G and also what they call IoT, which I think is maybe not the best term out there to use. But um, so there's a lot of things that kids are doing right now that they really have a good understanding of what radio does and radio has. So with that, some of the programs that we've done in our section is uh, we were very fortunate. We had a one of our teachers uh, from our local high school actually went to the Teachers Institute and came back and contacted our, myself. And so with that, I was able to present to her school. And then also with their STEM program, they have called a job shadowing. And so we had four different stations set up. One was just on basic electronics. One was on propagation, so space weather. Uh, we had one on soldering, one on making the communications problem, the hamshack, and one on more of like um, they call a, a, like um, a direction finding, so fox hunting. Uh, they all love the soldering. They all love the hands-on stuff. Um, like you said, Anthony, before, make sure you coordinate. Um, the facility we used had a refrigerator full of sodas, and they sold them for 50 cents a can. One kid had a $20 bill, so he bought everybody a soda. And then we got a call from the school saying, oh, the parents were upset that kids got sodas. So we, then we had to just, you know, cut it off. So coordinating those things, you might think um, is not a big issue, but can be. Um, so with the facility we've used there. Um, so we've done that. Um, right now, we're working with the STEM program at the, that high school, and we're trying to raise the money to buy every student a small FM receiving that they can build little kit. You can buy these from China for about eight or nine dollars. Um, has the headphones, has the battery, everything's there. Um, very few parts to add in there. And so we're working to try to get the funding together from some of the ham clubs in the area that will provide every student, they'll build their own FM receiver and then have a transmitter that was built by a couple of the other students. So they could actually have their own radio station. And the teachers were very interested in that. Um, other programs, like you said, we had used a Boy Scouts. Very, you know, very. We did. We did invite one troop out to our a field day from our local ham club, and they enjoyed it because they just showed up. We had a program set up. They were all, you know, they could work on their merit badge, and be able to make contacts. Um, so they were very happy to work with that. Another group that we've also worked with, uh, like Girl Scouts and Civil Air Patrol we've had some interest in, but never seemed to be able to get follow through from them on coming out and running a program with that. But Civil Air Patrol, I think is another area that we could expand into from that. Um, and then um, on uh, September 1st, I'm actually presenting at the local library uh, for ham radio, so. Well, Eric, I, I have to agree with you on the fact that the students I've worked with always love soldering. That's been one of their top two favorite items. Fox hunting and soldering always seem to be near the top. So our next uh, our next uh, panelist will be Barry from Nevada. Well, hi, Anthony, and uh, great to be with Eric and Martha and uh, lots of great people. Can you hear me okay today? Yes. Great, great. So... Um, I probably have a slightly different variation than the others, and that's what's so great that Anthony and Martha and Eric say everybody's every youth coordinator does it a little different. So I've been a ham for 48 and a half years. I was 17 when I was a young kid, and uh, took off thereafter. And I would love to do that. Well, let me explain it, and then I would love to do that uh, poll. Can we do the poll there? Uh, do you have that set up on the system? Okay. So let me just say that. Uh, before I get started, uh, there's nobody after me. Is that right? As far as in, the fourth person isn't here today. You're on mute, Anthony. You're not hearing you, Anthony. Say again, Anthony. You're on I'm mute. sorry, I was muted. I, I don't see Colin, so yes. Uh, so after okay. you're done, then we're going to open up the questions. Good. I won't do this all the time, but I just want to know. So, um, 
You know, I, I've been doing this informal poll, and we're going to do it uh, on Zoom here in a moment. Uh, but the informal poll is uh, uh, the question is, you know, what got you into ham radio originally? And before I tell you the results of it, why don't we run the poll? Because this is a very fascinating one. We were doing a little prep work a couple of days ago. Um, we put it together. So, Anthony, I think you're going to get to run it here. Yes, I'm going to put the link in here again for people that have not done it, and they can do it. So I'm going to let's go ahead and share the screen. Oh, it's, not on, it's, it's not. It's not. on Zoom. It's on the. It's on the yeah, other one. Yeah, it's I on think. the. It's on the survey, and I have the. I have the live results. So I put the link in there, okay. so you can go ahead and click on that. Okay. And I'm going to bring up the results to show on the screen. Yeah. So, so uh, can you make it a little bit bigger so we can see the? Um, yes, I'm doing that right now. A little bit. Great. Okay, so the question is, what age were you? And so we have um, a pretty big smattering, 40%, was 7 to 11. Uh, we have a small amount under 7, and you can see it. So this is a more accurate thing. Mine has just been the question of what got you involved. And if you scroll down a little bit, um, people read a magazine. They follow Scout Leader and Boy Scouts. Grandparents involved in other kinds of radio. Um, CB, a friend of mine in college. Uh, here's a good one. Dad was a ham operator. He was in the basement. So you can read about these. So here's, this is showing what, what I've experienced. And that is somewhere early on, people get, it, get um, the seedlings get dropped. Now, whether they get their ham license or not when they're a kid, that's kind of a slightly different story. But those early on experiences what gets people in the ham radio regardless. And the way I came up with this original thought was a number of years ago we had a ham fest here in Reno, Nevada. Um, and, the, and, and two gentlemen in their 40s said um, they just got their license and we asked the question, how did you get involved? And it was an early, early singling. So um, let's go for there and then we'll come back to another question after. Um, um, can you give me or can somebody give me screen share availability and we'll come back to the yes. poll on the other half? Yeah, yes, sir, there you go. You got it Not right now. Great. So here in the Sierra Nevada Amateur Radio Society up in Reno, we have actually we have Diana, KJ7GVY. She's really big on helping kids out and she's been helping me. We've been working together. So we've been doing this through the local ham club. This is the premier ham club in Nevada. Nevada is made up of a little over 3 million people. Call, call it a million and a half in southern Nevada down in uh, Vegas, call it a half million in northern Nevada, and call it a million scattered out yonder. So it's really too big populace. So um, I happen to be on the board of directors, but the way this all got started was a few years ago, some ham said, well, you got a bunch of old gray hair guys, and, uh, you know, there's, there's no use. And I said, we could change that. So I've been doing it through the uh, through the Sierra Nevada Amateur Race Society, and then it's, it's since then for the state of Nevada, although most of it's in the north here. So not a lot on here, but we can see in our youth activities, we have an, uh, events coming up that Kids Day is old. It's already happening. I'm going to show you more on that. We have a jamboree on the air. In the week, in the monthly newsletter for our club, we get about 450 plus members. Um, we um, we, we we have a, I have a column around um, around youth. So the thing on this end is we don't do much in the way of at least I haven't. Maybe Diana has um, in the schools. Ours is more through the extracurricular. Scouts is fantastic, really really good. Um, we were doing some work a few years ago with the boys and girls clubs, and. Um, you, you, you just you just find the people when you can. The other thing I want to say is that I would say about uh, uh, three uh, two thirds to three quarters of my work is not working with kids. It's working with adults, helping them to be our advocates. They're the hams. Another kids too, right? We have a couple of kids who are I think 15 now, who just got their license a year ago. Very active. Their their dad's a ham. So uh, this sort of reminds me, in, uh, up in the mountains here, we have game wardens. Well, there's one, one game warden for like a big area. So it's like one section youth coordinator for a large area. I have a couple of things I want to show, and then maybe later I have a, a video that might be interesting if we have time or I can post it somewhere. So let me go back to, to, the, uh, 
to the to the kids. So the ARRL has um, there we go. ARRL's Kids Day. And in case you don't know, it's twice a year. It's the um, it's the in January. It's the first Saturday of the month, uh, and then in, in June it's the third. So it's the weekend before uh, Field Day, which is a little bit tough. And so pre-pandemic, I'm going to show you some cool stuff. We did some amazing things in different locations. We did one at Cabela's, which is an Outfitters. And uh, then we did, and I got an article on the QST. And then uh, another time we did it at a, um, a museum, the Discovery Museum, which was great. It was a little loud, lots of young kids in there. So we, so we made some really, really good head headway there. So that's a big one, and we get them up on the website. Now with the pandemic, um, uh oh, looks like I just went away. I might still be here. Are you, uh, am I there on on the voice? Because my computer stuck. Yes, you are. But we're you're we're seeing the screen okay. share from uh, okay. yeah, the uh, like, QST. I'll just, yeah, it looks like it's just disconnected. So maybe the computer will be back. Um, so uh, in January of I think it was 2019, I did a really big splash. We made a lot of progress, and we did it at Cabela's, which is an Outfitters, and. Um, we had a great turnout. So two interesting things happened. One of them is I got a piece on Ham Nation, which um, I guess I could get it up on a server and we can post it somewhere. And there's a 15 minute piece where um, Gordon West interviewed me and we had some Q&A and a whole lot of, a whole lot of um, interaction. That was very engaging. More for the adults, in my opinion, than the kids or the adults saying, wow, this is cool, we'd like to do this. Then I wrote an article um, in QST. So it looks like my uh, Zoom is not happy right now, but I'm glad that I, I came in through the phone. So those have been very good. The other I want to mention is that uh, Jamboree on the Air for Scouts is tremendous. Uh, I was a scout, once an eagle, always an eagle. But at that January 2019, if I've got the right year event, the Kids Day, uh, a ham who's a scout master, whose daughter, uh, a boy scout club master, and the daughter uh, was about to get her, um, I think it was called the, uh, it's not called Gold Eagle, it's called something else, an award over in Girl Scouts. So, yeah, it's the, the Gold the, Award? They call it yeah. the Gold Award. Yeah. So the short of the story is with the help of the father, who's a ham and, and an organizer, she helped put on Jamboree on the air a couple years ago. And uh, it was fantastic. And the, what's really cool about it is she created a process, a packet that our club can do. So activities, activities, activities is the name of the game. They don't always have to be big or large. Uh, one we did um, for, um, I think it was Kids Day last year in the pandemic, although I may have my, I might have my uh, uh, events a little messed up. Maybe it was for Jamboree in the Air was, there was a there was a Cub Scout uh, ham who was going up a hill with kids, and um, I think because of the pandemic, most of us couldn't go or didn't go. But got in the air, helped them through. Another time, I did something with some uh, a ham, a mom who's a ham, and her kids. So you just keep the process going. I don't know if my uh, if my system will come back or not. We'll see. And I do have a 15 minute video if that's of interest, or we can post it later. So um, I think that's all I have for now. Uh, back Very good, Barry. What I'll do is, uh, if you send it to me, I'll include it in this slideshow presentation. This will be available after the event. It'll also be posted along with the the YouTube and the documentation. So if you send okay. that to me, I'll okay. get it up on. I'll get it up included Perfect. in this. So what we'd like to do now is we'd like to go around and uh, get, let you guys ask the panelists some questions. You can either direct them at the whole group, or if you have things you think are specific to one person in the panel. Either way would be fine. And again, I will let uh, you either type them in the chat or raise your hand. I'll be happy to acknowledge you. And um, while we're waiting for that, uh, in the survey, um, when we ask how many people have interacted with their section youth coordinator, 50% of the people said they had not. 30% of the people said they had, 
and 20% of the people said they weren't sure whether there is one. And I can tell you right now that there's not one for every section of the 70 some sections. There's approximately one quarter of them that currently do not have section youth coordinators. So you might want to mention it to your SM. Uh, does your section have a coordinator that's active and uh, can you get them involved? So go ahead, Sterling. Hi there. Uh, I know Missouri is one of them that doesn't have one. And I've been picking on our section manager for some time and, and to no avail. Uh, but uh, my question is, um, and ironically, I was um, instant, I was messaging um, uh, Grant W4KEK. But what do you guys think about youth represent, like actual youth representation within the section youth coordinator like architecture a framework. So what I noticed is that the, the section youth coordination system is, is ran by, um, you know, for lack of a better term, uh, gray hairs and, and older people, right? And, and I've always thought, you know, when I came into the hobby some number of years ago, I heard, oh, section youth coordinators, that means to younger people. And there have been young, uh, younger uh, youth coordinators, but generally it's, you know, older people, but uh, who, you know, have experience and, and are very effective. You know, it's not to say that that's a bad thing, but uh, what do you think? What's your, what's your guys' opinions on, on that? Well, I'm going to go think? ahead and, I'm going to go ahead and yeah, answer go first on that, Sterling. Um, I think that's a great idea. And we've actually added an assistant youth uh, section, youth assistant section youth coordinator. I have a, a young lady who's just starting eighth grade this year and Katie Campbell. She was going to be here tonight, but it's her first night of band camp, so she was not able to be one of the panelists. But I think it's a great idea. And I think one of the problems is the whole idea of not having youth coordinators, a, a big problem in a section, but just having one person to handle a whole section as a youth coordinator, for me, at least in a section as, with as many groups as Ohio, is overwhelming. So I think it needs to be more of an organization. I think that's a great way to bring in both older and younger people into that role. But I'll let the other panelists go ahead. Well, Martha here, I have an opinion. Um, I would hate to be the one selecting the youth, the young person to be that. Because if you know, sometimes I go places and I'm introduced to a young person who's a really dynamic ham. And then I'm introduced to another young person, really dynamic ham. How would you pick? What kind of politics go into picking who's going to be your youth person? Plus, youth people, they don't stay young. You know, they finish school, they go to college, sometimes out of state, they take a job, often out of state. The, the person who preceded me in my position was indeed a dynamic young lady am, but she left the state to go to college and she stayed out of the state. At least I'm you know, I'm not young, but I'm, I'm still there. And the politics of picking among all the dynamic young hams, I'd hate to be in that position. Eric or Barry. Oh, um, I, Sterling, I think it's a good, a great idea. Um, the kids know more about things than what we do and what's interesting to them and all this stuff. Um, you know, and I don't know if there'd be any limit on how many assistant section uh, people that you can put on if it's just from a title position. I don't know if you'd have to really have to pick people, but you could get as many as I, I'm sure Anthony would say, if he needed five people, his section manager would say, put five people on. So you wouldn't have to really limit uh, your number from there. So that might be there. But then again, you do have the issue of aging out and going forward. So, and a lot of the schools right now, the kids are so busy uh, with all the extracurricular uh, extracurricular activities they have to do, uh, plus with all the, the way that they are providing the instruction right now, it, it might be very hard to find any candidates for that. Barry? Yeah, I'm back on the video, but I might not be linked if you can uh, spotlight me or whatever. Um, so pretty similar. Um, I, I My take is whoever you can get, the more the merrier. Uh, what did you say, Anthony? Maybe only a third of the, what did you say, a third of the half of the sections had coordinators, something like that? Uh, no, about about three-fourths have them, but about one-fourth does not. Yeah. But so uh, that's part, yeah. it's part of it. Part of it is how big is the area, how much can you do? Um, I, I like the idea of having the younger kids. One of the issues, 
not good or bad, is they will get older and they'll leave. We have this going on over at University of Nevada, Reno. <clears throat> it's a college here. Some people come as a freshman, some come partway through. And, uh, you know, if, I, if we can get them in there for about a year or two, and they don't have to be hams to be, a, to be in the club. Um, I think there is advantages for both older and younger. You get different perspectives. I think the older people, uh-oh. Can you hear me okay? I heard it. Yes. Yeah. The older, I think the older-ish people maybe have better, maybe have better organizational skills and will be around, maybe. But the younger, more dynamic, I think you probably need a hybrid. But, but the thing that I've seen is often there's not enough people to do it. Uh, prior to when I got involved, they had some younger people for a while. And I think it's great. So one of the things that I talked to Anthony and Eric and Martha about was I've been having a conversation with the folks at ARRL League, and we're going to see if maybe we can help them help us and maybe get a slightly different a structure or something that's going to keep it more going because it's really up to each section manager or uh, a U, U section coordinator. I, I think it's great. The question I really have is, Sterling and people that have questions like that, what do you think of going to the, and then fill in the blank, the section youth coordinator or the section manager and saying, hey, I want to help. Where can I help? Where can I help? How can I help? And, and see where it goes from there. Yeah, and if I may, um, you all have like really good points. Um, as a, a current president of a club for young amateurs, young amateurs radio club, all of the talk about selection and having to deal with people getting older and, and a former president of, of W0 Triple E, a university radio club at, at Missouri S&T. Yeah, people come and go. Um, one of the easiest ways to disenfranchise a young person is to get them involved in like some of the sausage making, if you will. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, uh, it, but some of the assistant ships might be actually really interesting for some young hams to actually develop kind of a pseudo not a career if you will but like kind of a um kind of a career you know so or some sort in uh, any amateur radio scene um but yeah i mean that that's a person i would go to but for 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 help if you know i was somebody who wanted to you know start a school radio club that's probably one of the first people i would ask uh, but knowing what i know and having worked in the I guess in the system and, and worked around the system for some time. Um, and, and having been at, having acted as sort of a, a youth coordinator myself, not an official one, but I'm a youth liaison for the region two, I region two, and then I've done all sorts of, you know, hodgepodge stuff. Um, the, and, and you've alluded to it too. The youth coordination system has like had, had, it, had it, has had its hits, hits and misses over the years. So hopefully like you got guys kind of get a, a better picture of what the ARRL and, and how it, you know, is organized, but, you know, with everyone bringing a, a new thing or their own way of running it is good, but also like what's the overarching like, architecture and, and, and plan and, you know, how, how does the league, um, you know, want things to be run and, and what is what did they have in mind in terms of like youth advocacy and, and engagement and that sort of stuff but it's kind of a rhetorical question so okay. great it, so it, we have we have a question from diane uh, kj7 uh, gvy you, i'm sorry go ahead barry yeah, I, I, just make, wait, 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 I just want to make one, one quick comment My, i mean i have a perspective and it's not about are you older younger or where are you on the ladder because this is just a it's a flat field organization it's 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 the question of what it, here's what I know on an all volunteer organization the way you get paid is not through money so you get paid through and then you fill in the blank enjoyment some value in your life a commitment a something so it it's I, I don't think I don't think it's a structure issue as much as a who can get in and help out when you have the time because our lives change all the time that's that's the thing I think it's great that many different people can get involved. Okay, thanks for letting me hop that in there, Anthony. So we have uh, we have two questions. We'll go ahead and go to Diane first, then we'll come back to Michael. Uh, Diane asked, during COVID restrictions, how have youth integrated online formats for ham radio-oriented activities? 
Well, I can speak a little bit first. Uh, we uh, did, I did some of my youth, normal youth activities that I would do in person via Google Classroom uh, with teachers. It took a little more planning and it was also a group of teachers I had worked with before. So it, it, that worked out very well and it's actually went great. Also, we're now teaching our local amateur radio classes that our local club teaches online with the goal of making them more inviting for students and more likely for a student to be able to attend because they don't have to travel and there's no problem with that. So we're trying to make our, our tech classes in the future all have a hybrid model where we both do in-person and direct or just uh, online. So uh, that's one thing. So maybe we can hear from other, the other uh, SYCs about this. Uh, I'll, I'll go, Anthony. Um, from our, my standpoint, uh, we've been totally shut out of the schools. The schools said, nope, there's nothing that we can come in and do or even do any kind of remotely. I think that was pretty much the no there. Uh, we have been, though, working with scouts and be able to do like their merit badges uh, via Zoom. So we've done those. The electronics merit badge a little bit hard because you have, have to build a project, uh, but we set up a survey monkey, <laughs> had them come in over a, a whole Saturday, just four at a time, and built their projects with them. We spread out in a room. And, and got them to do that. But yeah, COVID really has um, put a lot of restrictions in and still are uh, keeping a lot of the restrictions and a lot of the programs that we'd like to do with the high school and uh, schools, um, uh, still waiting to get those in place. Um, if there's no other, other responses, we'll go to Michael, KC6MEH. Go ahead and unmute Michael. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I was thinking of launching a Pico balloon for our troop. Has any of you done it? What do you think? Is it uh, not not hearing a, a what for your troop? He he. The question was he's thinking of at, launching a Pico balloon. I'm uh, one of the micro balloons. Um, Eric, we, I'm sorry, Michael, we, I was talking right before the meeting started tonight because our local club uh, members had done that in uh, late May, early June, and it's still up and circling around. So it has been an interesting activity, um, but there's a lot of things that you could get the students involved in the process because it's not just a matter of launching the balloon. There's the whole idea of calculating the amount of hydrogen used, uh, pre-inflation, stretching, launching, uh, the electronics involved in it. So there are a lot of things involved that could be a good project. Um, I think, Martha, have you done anything with balloons at all? I uh, witnessed a few, but I was gonna say, uh, Michael, um, try to look up Joanne Michaels. She's, I think she's out in the LA area and she does balloon launches with her students. She is a, a teacher and she does do balloon launches and actually coordinates balloon launches between other schools as well. So um, hopefully you can make contact with her and she will be your expert. And there's really a couple different kinds of balloon launches. There's balloon launches that are recoverable, uh, short distance launches. There are these ones, the one I'm talking about is up at 40,000 feet and we'll never see it again because it's circled the earth a couple times. Um, I can't remember Mike's last name now, but uh, he's from Michigan. He was, the, he's a principal at a school in Michigan. His group does the balloons that they launch and they go a couple counties away. They track them and recover them. They have video in them. So they're that, that type of activity is very popular. So there's multiple types of balloon activities out there. And I think we had a presentation in one of the previous Rat Packs on some of these. So uh, there's some in the list of the Rat Pack presentations. Uh, very, I uh, yeah, yeah I want to answer that in kind of a hybrid way. Uh, I want to partially answer this and answer the prior question about COVID. So I actually have never heard of a Pico balloon. So I'm like, wow, I learned something new. And then I get together with somebody else Part of this is learning from other people and bringing in technology or bringing in pieces. So having never done it, I might lean on one of somebody else to help us help them. Um, if there's somebody physically that can come that's local, that's even better. If not, maybe we do a planning session on Zoom and bring it in. And at the same to token um, on the COVID thing, so during the summer months, the non-winter months where it's too cold or rainy or windy, um, we tend to do more stuff outside, which makes it a little bit easier for COVID. Um, one thing that uh, we've done is a, um, uh, what's it called, a fox hunt, 
which is pretty conducive outside, particularly if you're separated or you have masks or things like that. The other is that shy of getting together in person, some of this stuff we can find videos and do kind of a tabletop classroom kind of thing. So you kind of make it work when, when, when you can. You try to get the kids involved and the adults too as soon as you can in, in, some, in some event. But I've never, I've never, never done the Pico, so learn something new today. So we have a, another question from Michael. Is anyone using computer science and radio digital in their youth programs? Maybe Michael, you might want to unmute and uh, give us a little more detail on what on the question. Uh, Roger that. Uh, we're uh, in our uh, clubs when we have five clubs in our area that are supporting youth programs. Um, we've tried to combine. We are combining computer science with uh, application digital radio, and um, and really this is for middle school. Uh, youth and it, uh, the youth today seem to be more involved in uh, in the computer and radio being an adjutant to the computer for communication. So um, we have found so, that that's pretty receptive uh, to a number of the teachers in our public school system. Yeah, that's so interesting because uh, most of these HDs, a lot of the radios I have. At some level, is a computer with an RF board in it, right? So um, being able to use things, I haven't done this, but be able to use things like DMR or or FT8 or computer-related things, I think people pe people can get can get can get into that. The other is the software-defined radios. I just bought a small little SDR the other day, and uh, I, I think the I think the piece is finding somebody in the in the area that is willing to take it on, knows something about radio or is willing to take it on. What, what do you think would be the thing that would have people go, yeah, I want to do that, Michael? Well, the traditional uh, has been fox hunting, uh, you know, for the games aspect. Of, we've done balloon launches for high school in the first two years in college in the physics department here. Um, computer, computer science additional uh, education has uh, been involved. Uh, someone brought up the idea or provide a kit, have a club provide a kit, and I think that's an excellent idea uh, for the youth to put that together. Um, and uh, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I did hear that's an expensive, not prohibitive, because uh, I would have to drum the funds to buy those radios, uh, those kids. We did ninety. We did ninety nine cent and a dollar ninety nine kits uh, that we purchased a bunch of on eBay. Uh, so you can do it really cheap. Uh, can you provide? Uh, is there a way you can provide us with uh, the information to do that? I have some information in my uh, full slideshow, the one that's listed in that uh, presentation. I also okay. put the. Uh, I'll put the link in the chat here for that slideshow presentation again. Good. Uh, wanna, but yeah, go ahead, Barry. I just want to say I want to mention one thing about kits. It's not the kit. It part of it is the age group. So uh, when we did uh, one of the events over at I can't think where, uh, we had actually a lot of really young kids, maybe maybe, maybe under eight. So in that case, instead of an electronic kit, it was more of a little flash card with a little beeper thing yes. that they put together. So if you look at maybe the educational curve of a human being, including a kid, all the way from super developmental through past college, you know, I think there's different things at different ages, at different slots. Um, just want to mention that because there's a lot of, lot of stuff available. Go ahead, Anthony. Oh, yes, definitely. And we found that even with some kids, they got quite a bit of enjoyment out of just desoldering parts out of uh, existing electronics. Just the whole idea of soldering, not so much the idea of building a, a working kit, but the whole idea of soldering was a unique concept to them completely. Um, what I'd like to do real quick here that will tie in with this, I'd like to go around the panel and maybe Give some examples of the things that you thought your kids had, were the most receptive to and some of the surprises of things they were not that receptive to that you tried to do. Well, why don't we go ahead and start with Eric, if you don't mind, Eric. 
Uh, you're muted still. I was in the chat. I, um, oh, yes, thank I, you. No, you got I was in the chat. This was a uh, FM radio kit that you can buy that runs on two little batteries, you know, the AAA batteries, and even has some earbuds with it. And I think they're about eight or nine dollars a piece. Um, you know, so and there's not a lot of parts you can see. So I, I posted that link there. That's one of the ones we're trying to put out there. Um, you can get any kind of kits. I know you can, you know, just the, the uh, uh, practice Morse code kits. I know you have that. Um, mostly I see the kids like the hands-on type of things. When we did that five rotations for our high school STEM program, um, the going out to do the fox hunt, going out to do the soldering, making contacts with different countries, those three got very good reviews. Um, the space weather, I think, was totally just went over their heads. They had no interest at all. Um, they didn't want to kind of do the lecture. So they liked the hands-on part. And the soldering was just soldering a wire, you know, teaching them about different types of connect, you know, uh, Western Union splices or pigtail splice, things like that, that they probably don't even, you know, would know about and then be able to put together and solder that. Uh, so they had a little something to take home, a little piece of wire that they had soldered. Um, they, so Martha, how about your hits and misses that you found with when you interacted with kids? Well, I was thinking of uh, my ACE class, my STEM enrichment class. Um, the students that I was working with at, at my last school were basically special needs, but realized that's a broad spectrum. Uh, my students were high-functioning students who had some learning challenges, such as dyslexia or ADD, ADHD, etc. cetera. Um, but one thing that really resonated with a lot of them is FL Digi. I had a friend come in and work with them on doing FL Digi, so much so that a couple of them actually spoke at the uh, youth forum up at, at Dayton one year and were telling folks about FL Digi. And I will tell you why that was sort of important for especially one of them. One of the students that I worked with had a speaking issue, did not speak well when there was any kind of nerves going up, which unfortunately was most of the time. But people didn't have to listen to him speaking on FL Digi. He could chat as much as anybody else via FL Digi, and he loved it. So much so, one of the... Um, events that the North Fulton Club invited my students to go help them with was a STEM night at another high school. And uh, there were some of the older hams there doing various things. And one of my students, this student that I was just talking about, was in charge of demonstrating FL Digi. And he sat with people time after time after time demonstrating FL Digi to them. And I don't know, 20, 30 minutes into the thing, he had no speaking issue at all. He was so comfortable doing what he was doing, totally no speaking issues. And we all witnessed this and his mother came up eventually and saw him, no speaking issues. You know, that, that's, that's a miracle, I love that. So um, some kids loved the Morse code, some did not. Um, it, you, know, you, you basically offer a spectrum and, and figure out what they like. Barry, what what type of hits and misses have you found? Boy, boy I like thanks. Yeah, thanks, uh, Martha. I had a little bit of speaking, whatever impediment yeah. way back when, and I, I I get it because when I when I get into something I like, all that goes away. Yeah. So um, something hands on. Now, for some people, it's soldering. For some of them, it's getting them on the air. The, the one the the two that I've seen, and it, it is hit and miss, is some of the kids like Morris Cove. Uh, we've done. The, there's these Morse code, um, if you can even find them, they don't make them new anymore. Uh, the scout buzzer thing, it's a buzz and a light and it's got that. And they like learning it and learning learning their names. So one, uh, how to say their name in Morse code. So one of our guys got together with them ahead of time at one of the kids' day and showed them they could send it back and forth. So I think the answer is enough to get them interested, but not so much put them over the edge. One of the things I think we do as not necessarily adults, but people that have been doing the hobby for a while is we have all this knowledge. So therefore we want to literally vomit on somebody. And I think <laughs> you have to make it, make, make it smaller. The other thing 
uh, we did something at the Boys and Girls Club, and this was mind-blowing. So this group was hand-selective about 15 people that were mostly from age 12 to 15. The older ones kind of were in the, I want to get out of here and go do something else. But the younger, the middle-aged ones were really engaged. And one of the things that happened is these two girls that knew each other, they were friends. When they realized one could stand here with an HG on Simplex and another person could be down away and talk to each other, they got connected. So for, what I think that is, is it's human dynamic with the kids, with other kids. The bomb, which is surprising, is some kids have mic fright. We all have mic fright. Or we get on the air, and, I don't know what to say. So you got to somehow get them out of the mic fright into the, the vocabulary or, or whatever they do. But when they're with other kids, maybe around the world, like there's the yacht group, which you can probably talk of, uh, Tony or Anthony, uh, and they see other kids, they, they kind of melt and they go, oh, wow, it's okay. Well, you know, it's uh, we didn't practice this, but I can really agree with a couple of the statements that the, the panel has made. With Martha's statement, I, I used to go into this one school every year in, in sixth grade and work do the radio day for a whole day, and one of the activities was Morris Code. And I noticed the one year when I did it, one of the, one of the students who was in the special ed class uh, just excelled at it. He just loved it. And when I did it the next year, I noticed when it came time to do the CW, he magically appeared in the class. The teacher had remembered this and sent him back to the class. He had told this teacher afterward, this is the first time he ever thought he was the best at his class at doing something. Excellent. And it, when you see that happen, it's just so remarkable and so, so rewarding. The other thing that uh, soldering has been popular, fox hunts have been popular. The thing that is, I think has been the biggest bomb and the least popular is voice contacts on the air unless it's in one of the two following circumstances a it's a contest or b it's other youth and that's why school roundup is good because it's both of those but otherwise they would much rather make an fta contact they'd much much rather make some sort of other digital contact than they would a voice contact they'd rather do morse code than they would so the, what, i think what was the b it dropped out of this and the a the, what was the b Oh, uh, the, 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 if it's uh, if it's other kids or if it's a contest. Yeah. yeah. They, they really like, and I think if you are going to do contesting, which is hard to do with schools because most of it takes place on the weekdays, I mean, on the weekends, and, and most of the time you're working with the kids on the weekend. But if you use the on score, on uh, online scoreboard so they can actually see it as a sporting event and start thinking of it that way, it really increases their interest in it. So those are the two ways I found. But again, the, the, the idea of operating digital to them appeals a lot more because they could pick up their phone and talk anytime. Now, what we did is because we wanted to do the contesting type of thing and the kid that's kid type of thing, we, we got a bunch of FRS radios that the school district had that was using for other purposes. We assigned each of the students a fake call sign with uh, two, a two by two call sign. And we sent them out and we told them every time you change floors in the building, you're eligible to contact everyone again. And we put 10 simplex frequencies in the radio. And we said, you turn this knob and you look for people. They loved it. We, they, we did that a couple of times. They just thought that was the greatest thing because they were talking to people they knew. And it was in a competitive type of environment. That's and created a, a gamification. Aspect. Yes, the gamification aspect. Don't forget about that. It's, it's a really important part of the process. I'd like to add in here. Um, one thing that I saw at my, stu with my, at my school with my students, and then I'm, I'm seeing it again at, at another school that I'm working with, um, talking to strangers. Kids don't like to do that, but uh, school club roundup and other activities uh, in my classes, if somehow we finished a lesson early and there was some time at the end of the day, um, we'd simply go back to the radio in the back of my room and re reach out on the two meters, see if anybody was out there to talk to the students. And the kids loved it. The hands loved it on their end and the kids loved it on their end. They're, con they're conversing. Um, the school that I'm working with that has an heiress contact coming up, uh, they set up a radio and they had the kids talk to other members of the club, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood, somewhere in the city. And again, on both sides, they loved it. The smile the kids get when they're talking on the radio is just magical. So folks, if you need a way to reach out to kids, get them on the radio. Yeah, and 
and don't forget it's it's perfectly uh, legitimate to have plants out there so that the people that they're talking to on the local radios are people that you know and have prepared the and you know can answer good ask good questions of the kids so there's nothing wrong with having that person on the other end be a plant who can carry on a great conversation with the kids it helps it helps the process go along as opposed to the random person sometimes you have difficulty with well it's interesting we, i was gonna say the, the school that i'm working with uh they had some plants but they advertised to their club that we're going to be doing this and after the second or third student we had all these hams wanting to come in and talk to them the That's plants great. the plants weren't there anymore i mean they were there but they weren't yeah. the ones talking yeah one of the one of the things i was surprised we did um a few years back we did one at the uh the boys and girls club and i was gonna i was i was a new net control operator on a friday for this particular net I brought some gear over and I figured they're going to be eating pizza and I'm going to be talking. Well, I was surprised the pizza came early, got them to wipe their hands. And I put one person on, you know, I ran the net, but I had them do stuff and I kind of mimicked in the side of the ear what to say and how to do it. And they ate it up. And I remember a few of them just said like, thank you so much. This is not to me. This is to the net. Thank you. I get it. I learned it. So there, there's some balance, whatever that is between, you know, it's Elmering and pushing him, holding him, making it okay. And, you know, when somebody mentioned, one of the panelists mentioned about they don't want to talk. I, I, I don't have kids, but I can only imagine, you know, as young kids, you're told, you know, don't talk to strangers. Well, there's all these strangers. So somehow <laughs> it's introduction and somewhere along the line, the magic switch flips and all of a sudden they go, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Other questions, uh, please raise your hand or type it in the chat. We'd be happy to get those. There's been some links in there. I put a link in for the clothespin key uh, using, uh, that's an under $2 kit you can build up. Uh, there's also one from uh, the, K, the 4S Q, QRP group. They have one. Uh, okay, so other questions, please raise your hand, comments, complaints. I might make a comment here. Yes. I don't do my, okay, there I am. Uh, for those that don't know, after this uh, session, after every session, I do a follow-up email. It will include a link to this video you're watching tonight, this presentation. I also include everything that's been put into the chat. So if you don't get it, uh, you'll get another chance when it comes to you, you can copy that out. Uh, so anyway, just so you know, it's coming. If you, if you miss something tonight, You'll, you'll be coming in the mail covered by tomorrow. Well, if there's no further questions, I'd like to thank our panelists very much for uh, for coming here, and I'll see if they have any closing thoughts before we... Yeah, I so have we'll one other. Around. I was on mute. I have yes. one other piece I wanted to Go right talk. ahead, Barry. Sorry. Uh, there, there's something, I just want to explore this with y'all, because uh, there's something that I hear from... Uh, adult hams, older adult hams, and I'm not sure I buy this, so I'm, I'm really curious. I hear the following statement. Why would a kid want to get on ham radio they, they can talk to anybody in the world on their cell phone and the computer? And I don't think that's accurate. I do think what's accurate is if they haven't been exposed to it, they don't know what it is. So I, I'm just, I mean, I hear this, and, and I'm curious what people think about that comment. And if you ever heard something like that. Okay, so I'll chime in on that. I sent an email to a guy that does QSO today because that is a regular comment on his podcast. Love his podcast. Love the guy. Love it. Love his uh, ham fest. Um, but it is absolutely not true. I've said it time and time again. They cannot pick up their phone and call anybody anywhere in the world. They absolutely cannot. Challenge them to do it. Pick up your phone and call somebody. I think, I think the technology. You so can go. You, you can get on and go. CQ, CQ, Japan. And if you got the the radio and the antenna, you can talk to somebody in Japan. And if you and if you got DMR, you can do it. Yeah. Immediately. But I think I think what you may be saying is the technology is available for the kids to do it, but the structure, the platform, the 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 social con context isn't there, I think, is what you're saying, something like that. Yeah, blow, blow their mind. Get on DMR yeah. and, and talk to somebody in Japan. Yeah. I have had that conversation. Um, one of my students asked, 
why do we need a ham radio if I've got it on my cell phone? I said, fine. Basically, last week in the school club roundup, one of my hams reached somebody down in Montserrat and talked to him. You pick up your phone and you do that. Well, you know, What's even just, happen? you know, even just when I use the online software defined radios, I found a couple things. One is a lot of students aren't used to tuning a radio. So they found that very intriguing right. to begin with. And, <laughs> and the fact that they, you know, what I do is I give them, I, have, I put that quick start guide in the chat. But I, what I do is I give them instructions and they have their own Chromebook or they have their phone or whatever they're using. And I let them, I give them a couple, and then every once in a while I yell out a couple frequencies to them where I've heard people so they're not just, you know, getting dead air. But the fact that they were able to tune and then they, of course, went off exploring other frequencies and they found other things. And they were very, just as intrigued as I was with my three tube regenerative receiver back in 1970. Um, or 69, whatever year it was. And, but the whole idea is they've never really tuned a radio. They're used to everything being channel uh, and not being something you have to search for. So the OSDRs is a great way, a great thing you can put in their hands. And it's the thing I've seen students pick up and I see them doing it on their own without any encouragement. So I've seen students have it on their phone after I've introduced it to them, they've done it on their Chromebooks. So I really suggest you take a look at that. And I also have a whole presentation on it, but that that's a quick start guide, about four pages that I actually provide to the students. And again, I don't give them paper ever. I give it to their teacher. They put it in their Google Classroom or they email it to them so that it follows them home so they have that, that tool that they can use. And I know, Barry, you mentioned about that, but uh, look at some of the emergencies that we've had. Um, in the DC area, we had the earthquake all cellular systems went down. You couldn't make cell con. 9-11, uh, you couldn't make cell contacts. You know, so those are something that when people say, oh, you, they can do it, but they're still, I, we had one person in our club, a family came and it was a mother and she wanted all her kids before they went off to college to get their license so they could at least talk if something happened. Nice, from that yeah. Perspective. So if we run right. into that. So the other thing I'd like right. to say is that, um, I was just at a VE testing session. I know we were talking about youth tonight, but we had a woman who was 91 years old, sat and got her tech license. So Lovely. I think you can say it's never too young and it's never too old to get right. your license. That is so good. My dad, who's since long gone, um, he was 80 when he got his license. Yeah, I, I'm glad we had this conversation because I suspect that this is not an accurate conver uh, thing that we're saying, right? That that you can just pick it up. That you think that. I think at some level, as I make the story up, you know, people that have been around for a while and say that as as like a barrage or a reason not to work with youth or something, because I don't think that's true. That when I've worked with youth and you get the magic of ham radio, whatever that is, you know, they go, wow. I think Barry gets to giving them understanding of the technology. You know, when we when I was growing up, at least. You understood how a, a you know, a, a, a combustion car worked with the gas and how it gets sprayed in. I bet you ask kids now today, how does that carburetor work? You know, what's fuel injection? They just put, they know to put gas in it and that's it. They know to plug their charger phone and that's it. They don't understand what the technology is. And I think that's something to get them to understand is what the technology that they're basing all this upon. So that if something does go wrong, they have an understanding of what they're doing. Well, thank you all. Uh, appreciate you coming to the to the panel discussion. And always, you're always welcome back to Rat Pack. We have uh, sessions all the time coming up, and we'd love to have you. Uh, please, this link will be available at, at the Rat Pack uh, uh, website and on the Rat Pack list. Please share this with anyone else you know who might be interested in youth involvement in amateur radio. I'll turn it back over to Dan. All right, thank you. This has been very enlightening to me and I'm sure a lot of you. I've learned a lot of things. A lot of stuff comes to my mind. Uh, one of the things we've tossed around in another arena of abuse was a, a space program where we were teaching. I see um, Bruce has got his hand up. Bruce, go ahead and I'll, I'll finish up after you talk. Yeah, just a, just a quick question. Are we going to get the results of the poll before we hang up? Yes. And actually, I'm going to put it right in the chat so you can oh, all. Need, yeah, that second part of the poll about the youth. 
I, I, I've got it in the chat so you can all view it yourself and uh, we'll keep it we'll keep the link on the YouTube site too so hopefully more people will complete this so it'll be a live survey uh, that will continue after today so please get that link from the uh, chat there the Google Docs link that I just put in there and uh, that'll let you keep following the survey currently we have 22 responses uh, in the survey and I can just run down over the screen real quick here to show you what things look like but you're welcome to view it on your own especially as more people get time to put it in. So it looks like the vast majority, the, the largest number by far was the 12 to 15 year old group, but the second largest group was the over 30 group. So you notice that there seems to be a sweet spot between 12 and 15 that goes away for a few years and doesn't reappear until, th until over 30. So that's maybe the spot we wanna do a lot of our focus on that 12 to 15 year old age group. Uh, some of the more comments here that, that were added. Um, you can read through all these on your own. It's much easier to do that. Um, we even have more people that are not sure if there's a section coordinator, section youth coordinator in their district than we had earlier in their section than earlier. And um, as far as recruiting people, uh, about 68% of the people said they recruit both youth and adults. Um, I, uh, only uh, one person said they do not do any recruiting. So as a group, we tend to be recruiting and evangelistic amateur radio operators. And uh, I'll let you guys again, read the comments on your own because that'll be much more effective. Hey, Anthony, go back up to the one that has the 30% of the third, age 30. So I want to make a comment about, yes. about that. It, it dawned on me there's a, you know, uh, when you outreach to people, you think you're outreaching to them and you, maybe you're outreaching to them and they're outreaching to somebody else. So an interesting thing about that 30 age, not everybody has kids, but somewhere in that 30 age plus, those kids will start having kids at some point, right? And so, so from a demographic, so maybe it's a second time to like expose them and then they, they work with their kids as they grow up. Yes, we've had a number of times where we have had a student come back later to get his license. They've often came with a parent who's also gotten their license at the same time. Okay, is there anything else? I think that's it for tonight, Dan. All right, I'll finish with my thought here. One of the thoughts I have, would there be a value to the folks here and, and the, the president, uh, you, you, uh, people doing this presentation tonight, if we could come up with a means of doing something like uh, uh, a youth thing along this line to entice people using online YouTube, like we're doing right in YouTube, uh, um, Zoom, like we're doing right now uh, on a national level. In other words, uh, there's a lot of places, especially in the rural areas and small places like that, that don't have the opportunities. Is there a way we can bring that, those opportunities to them through the experiences you guys can bring to that? Is there a myth, method we can put that together with? Give that a thought, and they might email me or get a hold of Anthony if you got some thoughts on that. And I see Dave, you got your hand up. Uh, yeah, my question was, uh, are there any recommendations for uh, doing a booth at a fair? Yes, and I have some on my uh, full presentation on, on, on that. The thing I want to just caution you about, though, on doing that, just make sure you're aware of what your audience is going to be like because um, you can get lost in the shuffle very easy, easily and you can put a lot of effort into it. Um, and it's not quite the same type of effort that you want to do when you're working with a smaller group. So you have to be uh, – the thing I found the most part is that ability to take home the information. So that scannable – uh, QR code type of thing, because you don't really get a chance to sit them down and have them explain things in great detail. They're, it's much more of a passing audience. So uh, I've had opportunities before and I found that actually less useful to yet less useful, less useful to expand my energy that way than to work with smaller groups of teachers. Um, I think the make, I think the maker fair, the, uh, are you talking about a county fair? What kind of fair are you talking about, Dave? Uh, well, it's a it's a fair that they have every year here in Kamii. Uh, it's a more or less of appreciation day for all the uh, vendors, all the business owners, and everything else. They've been doing it for like 80 years. I'm not sure how many, but uh, and everybody gets together and they have food booths and they have 
uh, raffles and uh, a lot of vendors, and it's just kind of a walk by thing, parades. Yeah. We, we did one here in Reno a couple times before COVID called Kids on Big Rigs. So, uh, big Rig is uh, like a big semi or a fire truck. It was put together by somebody else. And so we've had, we've been there twice pre-COVID. Uh, the younger kids have fun, but that doesn't stick. The, the slightly middle-aged to older kids, it sticks. There is that issue Tony uh, Anthony talked about, is how much time do you have? The one area that I've seen pretty good success is a maker fair. So, it, you know, it depends where they are. If you can follow up with them, give them something or get their name or just follow up and invite them back, that, that's where the magic happens, I think. How many how many people come to the fair? Uh, well, we get them from all over the state of Idaho for this one fair with people that have grown up here. Uh, they usually come back for their high school reunions and everything else, and they bring their kids, and it's a, it's a pretty big deal. Uh, COVID shut it down last year, but it looks like we're going to go through with it again, go through it with it this year. Uh, so it's just, you know, we've lost quite a few vendors for it, but we're going to see how it goes. Dave, um, we've had two um, that we've done uh, historically in our area. Uh, one is the National Night Out, uh, which was just a few weeks ago. And then, of course, next month is Preparedness Month. So working with like the county EMA, they usually do a lot of outreach. Um, they had a prepared, they used to, they were running a preparedness fair. Of course, they scaled it down for this year. But those two have been very much, uh, we've supported in the past and got a lot of interest. Okay. Yeah, I'm working with one of the uh, uh, emergency managers and uh, I'm trying to find out how, he has written a few, thing, a few things a few years ago and it's called 52 Weeks of Preparedness. And it's a really nice article, but there's just no way we can print that many copies of it. I mean, it's about a hundred pages and you only get 500 pages in a ring. Dave, so I'm trying to trying Dave, to find a way we can put a link to it so they can uh, use a QR code and put it on their phone. Yeah, the, 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 I found that that's the best way to do it is use QR codes. And by the way, if you want a really simple, easy QR code generator, you can actually do them right in Google Sheets. There's a formula that actually generates a QR code from a URL. Okay, QR code generator. Yes. And what was it called? Uh, you can do it in Google Sheets, or there's also a number of them online that you can use. You just simply put in the, the URL you want to use. I do a combination of two things. I do the QR codes plus a tiny CC uh, thing so they could actually, the people that don't have a phone with them could jot it down or they would be able to remember it. Uh, because you could, with that, you get to choose a customized HTML. It's going to start, so that one that I used for the presentation tonight, that tiny.cc slash rpsyc was an example of doing that. And there's other URL shorteners out there, but the, it also lets you generate QR code. So it's both a thing that they could actually type in if they wanted to or write down, but then they also have the QR code. And I find that much better than handing out the paper. I think more of it gets home and more people can find it after the fact and you don't have the expense of doing all the paper printing. And also it means you're not gonna run out. Yeah, that's a big thing. Yeah, and it's, it just gets real expensive when you're printing you know, yeah. paper and ink, so uh, after a while. Those sheets that I had, uh, I just laminate them and then I have them out so that people can access them. Okay, the lamination doesn't uh, bother reading the no. QR codes at all. Huh? No, yeah. they're pretty they're pretty durable, and actually, if you make them large enough, they can shoot them from many many feet away. Uh, a lot of times, when I'm doing a slide presentation, uh, I'll put QR codes up on the slideshow, and people in the whole audience can shoot them with their phones, no problem. Sounds like a great idea. Can I call you if I have problems? Absolutely. Uh, okay, that's about all I have. I really do appreciate the information. This has been a real good presentation all the way around. This is Anthony's idea, and it's a great one. I'd like to see it come back and do some more like this. I love your idea, Dan, of doing something on a national basis. My experience over the last few years has been that each section each manager is, you know, coordinator is doing their own thing. This is the first time I've done something with a group. And uh, you know, getting a little horsepower so people don't have to recreate it. Plus, you, you have a good point. Lots of people are spread out in little places across across the country. So how can we provide it for them? Great idea. That, that, that's a good a good thing. And 
I, I think we need to find a way of organizing it and such. There's a lot of spinoffs that come from that. Not only can we help the youth across the country on a national basis and get them involved with each other and they can talk to each other on radio or whatever, they become friends and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a learning process, but it's also a great tool for the teachers, just like tonight. Uh, you guys are learning a lot. I certainly learn a lot. Uh, so give us some thought. Um, maybe, uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll pick on Anthony. He could, you can fire ideas at Anthony there. We can work together through uh, Rat Pack and see if we can make something like that happen if that's something you'd like to do. Great idea. You know, the friendship piece is so is such a big, a big a component. There was an article, there was something on the news, which I found out of Sacramento, and I live in Reno, so not too far from here, somehow made the news about um, a ham in, I don't know, Oregon or Washington and a ham in Sacramento. And, and it wasn't over the radio, but because of their radio connection, one person called another one day, thought he missed dial. His wife is a nurse, figured out that he was having a stroke and blah, blah, blah. It, there's something about people helping people, Elmering, helping, connecting, conjoling, practicing together that, I mean, in all the years, that's the thing that I remember more than the technology, you know. In this environment, what I like about it is the two-way street. You have a mentor thing, and the mentor expects to speak, and the, and the student expects to learn. In this environment, it's a two-way thing. The students are expected to speak as well, and the instructors are expected to learn. So it's a growing process, and everybody gets a whole lot out of it. It's a lot of uh, self-reward out of it. I, I, just, I, think it's, I think the seed's there. I think it's very doable. We just have to have the right people to put it together. All right, is there anything else out there? Well, again, guys, this has been great. A beautiful presentation. I'm actually gonna thank you again for coming up with this idea. This has been great. We have to do something like this more. Um, I think that the, this is the kind of stuff that moves youth uh, education in the whole program. And I say youth, that's not an age thing. <laughs> you know, uh, there's people in their 90s that are youth, but it's a, it moves it forward. And that's what we need. And getting people's minds uh, uh, working together to make it happen. I love it. That's what this is all about. Well, with that, unless we have some more comments or or um, questions, okay, I have to go ahead. I just have one quick one. I'd like to thank Eric, Martha, and Barry again. Not only did they come tonight, but they also spent about an hour with me practicing on Monday night, and we went over some things. So they really put some effort into this, and I really appreciate it. Yes, everybody did a great job tonight. Everybody did. Anthony, I always learn from you. So anytime I can get some time on the Zoom with you, I always feel it's worth it. <laughs> Thank we you. We all learn from Anthony. He has been a, a godsend, so to speak, uh, to the organization here. Okay, gentlemen, ladies, it's been great. Appreciate you coming and very informative, very informative. I'll pull the plug here and say 73s, everybody. I hope to be hearing from you again. 73.